So we begin this morning in the book of Acts, chapter 20. And as we're following along in our text, we're following the Apostle Paul as he's on what we call his third missionary tour, his third missionary journey. You see, in this missionary journey that he's been on, this third one, he's been around the western and the central part of the Roman Empire, and he's been on this tour preaching in different churches, doing evangelism, strengthening churches for several years now. But finally, he's decided it's time for him to head back both towards Jerusalem, because he has a special meeting that he wants to do there at the temple, but then also eventually towards his home congregation there in Antioch. And so he has with him at this time, when we pick it up in the book of Acts, he has with him a collection, an offering of financial support from the Gentile churches of Western, uh, the Western Roman Empire to give to the, uh, the needy, the, the, the mostly Jewish churches of Jerusalem and Judea. He has with him a group of friends. There's a great group of friends around him from several different churches that are traveling with him on this journey eventually back to Jerusalem. And he has his way of making his way southward down the coastline uh, beginning there in a city called Troas. You remember that last week? That's where the young man fell asleep and Paul raised him from the dead and, and it was a crisis of a man falling asleep in church, but it all worked out okay. <laughs> from there, Troas, Paul made his way down southward and he made several stops along the way that I'm not really indicating on the map that you see right before him, but he ended up in a place called Miletus. He sailed past Ephesus, coming southward, and came to this place, Miletus. But he wanted to speak to the church leaders of Ephesus. In the text, it's called the elders of Ephesus. And as he makes this appointment to speak to the church leaders of Ephesus, he sails past them from Miletus, and he expects the church leaders from Ephesus to walk the 30 or so miles from Ephesus down to Miletus so that he can meet with them. And that's the whole stage that we're set here when we come to Acts chapter 20, verse 18. You'll notice the opening words there. It says, and when they had come to him. Again, and when they had come to him. They, they had to walk at least a day's journey, some 30 miles from Ephesus to Miletus. Now friends, that's a dedicated group of pastors and leaders, is it not? Hey, come meet the Apostle Paul. Here's the thing, you just got to walk 30 miles to do it. It'd be funny how many guys they would find that suddenly didn't fit into their schedule to do that, right? But this shows the great love that these leaders, and it's no mistake that they had this kind of love. It's no accident, I should say. Paul ministered there among the Ephesians for two solid years. And it wasn't just two solid years, but it was two years of amazingly productive ministry. We've talked about this in, in earlier chapters of the book of Acts, that there are some seasons of God's work that are remarkably fruitful. Look, there's some times in God's work where you just you know, hitch your, your shoulders to the plow and put your head down and you plod ahead step by step and it seems like it's just small, hard, difficult work, but you do it. But there's other times in the work of the Lord where it just seems like blessing rains down from heaven and you can't believe it. You can't believe how God's pouring out his blessing. Those two years that Paul had in Ephesus was one of those just beautiful times where it seems that God was sending forth the, a measure of his spirit, a measure of power upon the work, and the word of God was being blessed and multiplied, not just in the city of Ephesus, but all over the region. Now those kind of two years of work, that made a close bond between Paul and the leaders of this church in Ephesus, so that when he said, guys, I'm not gonna stop in Ephesus, I believe he didn't stop in Ephesus because he knew he couldn't have a short visit there. You know how it is when you, stop, you, you love people so much? How hard it is to have a short visit among them? So Paul said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'll sail past and I'll just meet with the leaders. You come down from the south. So look, let's start again. Verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know that from the first day that I came to Asia, again, I just want to remind you, that's the Roman province of Asia, modern day Turkey. He's not talking about like China, or Korea or something like that. You know that from the first day when I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, 
testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's beautiful about this, do we call it a speech? Do we call it a sermon? Do we call it a message? I don't know exactly what you want to talk talk about, because Paul's not teaching to a congregation. He's speaking to these leaders of the church at Ephesus, and as he speaks to them, we have one of the most wonderful sections in the book of Acts, because here the heart of Paul as a pastor is laid bare in a unique way. Most of the sermons or speeches or messages that we have recorded by Luke, by Paul, in the uh, book of Acts, most of them are evangelistic, right? Here's Paul speaking to Agrippa. Here's Paul speaking, you know, at Mars Hill. Here's Paul speaking to another. Most of them are evangelistic. This one is very pastoral. This is the heart of a pastor speaking to other leaders And it gives us a very unique glimpse, sort of a bearing of the soul of Paul as a pastor. So they gather to him. The Ephesian elders, they're so happy to be there. They love Paul so much that they willingly walk 30 miles just to spend these hours with him. And the first thing that he says to him, it surprised me just a little bit. Did you see it there in verse 18? If you didn't know Paul as well as you know him, You'd almost think that he's bragging. He says this in verse 18. You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. Hey, guys, let me start off by saying, you know the kind of life I lived among you. Think about it. Paul didn't hesitate for a moment to begin his message to them by calling attention to his own faithful, humble service among the people there in Ephesus. He called himself, excuse me, he called attention to himself, I should say, as an example. Now please, note this. He did not call attention to himself as an example instead of Jesus. No, nobody would think that for a moment, right? Nobody would think for a moment that Paul was saying, don't look at Jesus, look at me. No, no, never. But rather what Paul was saying is he's saying, I want you to take and look at me as an example of someone who follows Jesus. I'm following Jesus. I want you to follow Jesus. If you want a picture of what that looks like, look at my life and you can see something of it there. I tell you, I love this. I love this revelation about Paul. It's not like we didn't know it before from looking at his life, but we look at it here and it hits us in a special way that Paul didn't act like a religious celebrity. He didn't walk around and expect other people to serve and honor him. But did you see that in verse 19? This is what he says. He says, I just wanted to be serving the Lord with all humility. That's what he did. Now, I say this just to point out. Just in a few minutes in this talk that Paul has with the Ephesian elders, in just a few minutes, he's going to talk about his preaching and his message. So he'll lay great emphasis on that. But make no mistake. Paul first talked to them about his life and about the fact that he had a life that preached the gospel. Friends, both of them are important. The message itself is important. It's very important for the man who stands in the pulpit, for the man who wants to deliver the message, whether it's to a small audience or to a big audience, whether it's one-on-one or to a multitude. It's very important for the person who delivers the message to deliver a faithful message. That's important, vitally important. But can I say as well, it is just as important that that person's life be exemplary as someone who has been touched by the gospel. That you have a life that preaches as well. I tell you what, I, I think about this, and, and I, I don't know if you know or you don't know. I figure most all of you know. You know, that I, I mean, I'm fairly new to this congregation. I've been here, what, about a year and a half? And I've been very, very blessed. But there's not a week that goes by without me considering that this congregation, that, that the blessing I enjoy here, that the beautiful relationship that, that was built on the foundation and the work of another man, Ricky Ryan, who ministered here so faithfully over the years. I don't forget that for a moment. And, and he could leave in the same way that the way this Apostle Paul left, right? Saying, listen, my life was the same. I was here in the pulpit. You, you see me in the pulpit, you see me in Costco. I'm the same kind of guy, right? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? 
And listen, there's something to the integrity and the power of that that God uses. It, 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 just, it just is an extension of the truth of the gospel. This is true. It's true objectively. It's true in history. It's true in time and space. But it is also true in my life. And that's an essential connection that Paul made. Look, I would say in a similar pattern, my friends, every one of us can be a good example of how to live the Christian life. There's not a single person in this room that, that is sort of excused from that responsibility. And I bet some of you, you might be thinking, well, listen, I'm really a new Christian. I've only been walking with the Lord for a year or so. Surely I don't have this responsibility. No, you have the responsibility too. You know what you have the responsibility of? Of showing what a young Christian life should look like, right? Every one of us has this great responsibility of saying we should live a Christian life that is an example to other people. That the transforming power of Jesus Christ at work in our lives should be an example to other people. I'll give you sort of a frightening thought to consider. All right, what if the entire church had the same commitment to God that you do? What if the entire body of Christ was as obedient in personal holiness as you? What if the entire body of Christ um, was as generous or ungenerous with financial support as you are? What, what if the entire body of Christ supported missionaries the way you do? What if the entire body of Christ prayed like you do or pursued biblical understanding and knowledge the way you did? How would that look in the whole church? And some of you think for a moment, you say, well, churches would shut down all over the city. <laughs> Call back those missionaries, right? On and on and on. Well, it just shouldn't be that way, right? Now look, the great encouragement to my heart as I look out upon you and as I preach to you, I think God has blessed us with so many exemplary Christian lives. Well, let me just encourage you to keep pressing on. And for more and more of you to take it seriously. To be able to have this heart that says, you know what kind of life I lived among you. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing for you to say when you're sharing Christ with your co-worker? To be able to, not with pride, not with arrogance, but just in that sweet way that Paul must have said it to the Ephesian elders. You know what kind of life I lived among you. Well, you know what? God can work that in and through you as well. Now, it wasn't only about the life Paul lived but it was also about the message that he preached. That's what he speaks about in verse 20. Did you see that? In verse 20 he says, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you. Pa Paul could solemnly say before these elders of the Ephesian church that he kept back nothing that was helpful. He didn't only teach the topics that were pleasing to him, he proclaimed it all. And isn't that a beautiful thing? for a pastor to be able to say to his congregation. I just didn't, you know, give you my topics that are fair. I didn't just run over my four or five hobby horse favorites with you, right? But, but I love to bring you all the truth of God. I love, and Paul doesn't say it specifically here, but it fits so well with what he said. I love to walk with you through books of the Bible. You know, one of the great reasons why we love to teach verse by verse through books of the Bible is because you just have to teach on things, right? Sometimes pastors don't want to teach on things. They, they don't want to teach on certain challenging topics. They don't want to teach on certain convicting topics to their own life. They don't want to teach on things that might be controversial in the culture. But when you go verse by verse to the books of the Bible, you're sort of forced to, aren't you? Well, here it is. Deal with it, pastor. And so Paul could say that, and he said it with great confidence. I kept back nothing. Matter of fact, in verse 21, he continues, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks. I'm not, I didn't limit my ministry to just one segment. I wasn't just trying to carve out one little market share. I preached to whoever would listen. I wanted them all to come to Jesus Christ. And then in verse 20, he also says, and I did it from house to house. Now, that's a wonderful thing that sort of tips off to us something about the way the Ephesian church was organized. And I don't mean to get into this in great depth. I feel like I just need to mention it just for a couple of moments. We often make a mistake when we take our modern way that churches are structured and organized and impose them upon the, uh, the first century. 
When it says here that Paul met with the elders of the church of Ephesus, we usually think this way. We usually think, okay, the elders of the church of Ephesus. Well, our church has elders. It would be sort of like an elders board meeting over there at Miletus. And so they got together and there was, a, you know, our church's elders and there's, well, no, but by analogy, it wasn't exactly the same. You see, because you need to understand, in Ephesus, there were a lot of Christians. There were hundreds of Christians. Based on the way they talked about how Christianity impacted the community there, there were thousands, if not, there were hundreds, if not thousands of Christians. But very rarely did they all meet together in one big room. Architecture just didn't allow it. Christians weren't allowed to have their own buildings. There weren't many public buildings that could accommodate everybody, or at least with any kind of regularity. No, the normal meeting for people back then, the normal way of meeting, was in house churches. And almost certainly, these elders of the church at Ephesus, we would probably call them pastors. We would probably call them pastors of the house churches scattered all around Ephesus. Now, this is just what we have to understand about the early church that until they received permission from the Romans, until they had the freedom in the culture to build their own buildings, that they by necessity met in houses. I just need to mention this, and I, I don't mean to step on any toes or say this, I'm just trying to give you a historical fact here, that though Christians did meet in homes in the first centuries, they didn't really do it out of choice. It's not like they said, well, meeting in homes is more spiritual, so that's how we'll do it. They did it out of necessity. And as soon as Christians could build and make their own buildings for assembly, they did. And they met in larger groups. Well, you can argue all day long whether or not it was better for them to meet in houses or better to meet in large assemblies. But I'm just laying down to you the historical fact. In the beginning, they met in the house churches because it was necessary. And when they could build their own buildings and meet in larger places, they did. But here Paul says, I ministered, and you could also write in there almost, verse 20, I, I know I'm imposing on the text just a little bit, but you could almost impose on there, from house church to house church, because that's just how the congregation in Ephesus was organized, was assembled in house churches. Now Paul's going to go on here and continue on pouring out his heart. Verse 22, he says, and I hope you catch a little bit of the drama here, right? Because it's a very dramatic passage. And now, excuse me, and see... Now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. It's interesting, isn't it? Paul begins, men, you know what kind of ministry I had among you. You know how I lived. You know the message I preached among you. You know how I did it from house to house. And now I want you to know that I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, and I don't know what's waiting for me there. He says it in verse 22, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Paul didn't know what was ahead of him, only that he had reason to believe that it was bad. You see, Paul said that as a man who had already known great tribulation. When Paul said, I'm expecting bad things, he was a man well acquainted with bad things. He's not talking about his luggage getting lost along the way, right? He's talking about grave physical harm coming to him. He knew that he had to go to Jerusalem. He said he was bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. He knew that trouble was waiting, but you know what? He didn't know what the trouble was. Only that God kept telling him along the way, trouble is awaiting you in Jerusalem. Trouble is awaiting you in Jerusalem. Now, you know what's thrilling about this whole book of Acts? We're going to follow Paul along when he gets to Jerusalem and see the trouble that he found there in Jerusalem. And you know what it was? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to let it build up the anticipation. Well, of course you can read ahead. It's not like it's a secret. But man, it's really thrilling to see what, how this works out, how this, this understanding the trouble was waiting for him, how it's all going to work out for him there. But please understand what he says. He says, I don't know the things that will happen to me there. Now, I just want you to look at verse 24 very quickly, where he says, none of these things move me. 
Paul lived with this sense of uncertainty. I know that trouble is coming, but I don't know what it is. But you know what? That doesn't move me. Now that work that Jesus Christ did in the heart of Paul to make him accept that, some of you need to accept that same work from Jesus Christ today. I mean, before you leave this room right now in your heart. Because for some of you, what drives you crazy in life is what? It's uncertainty. You, you, you could handle anything if you only knew what was coming down the road, right? And that's basically your prayer to God. Oh God, tell me. Oh God, show me. Just show me the future. Show me what it's going to be. If there was like a fortune teller or a magic eight ball that could tell you the future, you'd be highly interested in it because you feel like you could trust God for anything except uncertainty. Friends, can you, can you allow God to do the same work in your heart that he obviously did here in the Apostle Paul? Where Paul says, I don't know. Not knowing what awaits me. I know it's going to be bad, but I don't know what it is. And you know what? None of these things move me. I'm not going to be moved. I'm not going to be shaken. I'm not going to be moved on from my, my, uh, my position in Jesus Christ, even though I'm filled with uncertainty. I would hope that each and every one of you could say right along with Paul in verse 22, not knowing the things that could happen to me there, yet realizing Jesus Christ will be with me at all. Look, I know it's kind of trite. It's almost a cliche, right? I hope I'm not offending your ears with a cliche. But how does it go? It says this, look, I don't know what tomorrow brings or what tomorrow holds is probably a better way to say it. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. Well, you need to just nourish your heart with that, right? You don't know what tomorrow brings, but you know the everlasting God who holds it. And that was Paul's confidence. Even though, look at what it says in verse 23, the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. You see, Paul recognized the dangerous road ahead of him, and apparently he had received many words of prophecy or warning telling him of the danger already, but he wasn't set off track by that danger, not by a bit, but rather he says, I'm willing to lay my life down for the gospel of the grace of God. And I love how he puts it. Did you see it there in verse 24? These are exciting words. He said, nor do I count my life dear to myself. I like that. I like that little picture of Paul. I think of him there as an accountant, right? Accountants are people who count things, right? Paul's an accountant, and he's adding up the ledger. He's adding up the figures of his life, right? He's thinking about his life without God, his life with God, the past, the future, the present, all of it together. He's laying it all out as if it were sums upon a table, right? He's filling in the spreadsheet, and then he calculates it just like a good accountant. And you know what he says? He says, I don't count my life dear to myself. He weighed carefully the credits and the expenses. And in the end, he didn't count his life dear, but rather he compared himself to how great God is and how he could serve him. And you know what? At the end, he says, none of this moves me. Looks to me like death may be awaiting for me, but I don't count my life dear to myself. None of it moves me. Then he says something else in verse 24 using a different picture. He says, so that I may finish my race with joy. I love it. Now he puts down his accountant's calculator and he picks up the track shoes of a runner, right? He's not an accountant anymore. Now he's running. And he says, I've got a race to finish and nothing's going to keep me from finishing the race with joy. By the way, I love what it says right there. Just a little tidbit from verse 24. Did you notice that it says, my race? That I may finish my race. Paul says this in a few other places in his writings too. The idea that his race was peculiar to him. And your race is peculiar to you. Sometimes we make an enormous amount of trouble for ourselves in our walk with God when we try to run somebody else's race. Would you just stop trying to do that? Don't run their race. Run your race. God has a race. You don't, I'm not trying to say that your Christian life is different. Or you have, a, you have a, a different set of beliefs or a different doctrine or a different Bible. No, no, no. There's this great common ground that we have. But you know how it is. The work of God in your individual life, what he works in you can be very different from somebody else. You have a peculiar calling, a, a peculiar work that God wants to do in and through your life. Well, for heaven's sakes, run your race. And then by all means, do it with joy. That's what he said there in verse 24, right? Paul looked at the race course in front of him and none of it moved him. 
He could see that it wasn't going to be an easy race. It wasn't going to be just running around a track, right? But rather, what do they call it? The, the, the obstacle thing, the steeplechase, whatever it is in track and field, where they got to run over hurdles and over water. No, this Paul saw that kind of race in front of him. He says, but I'm going to run it, and I'm going to do it with joy. Now, in each one of these things, Paul was following the steps of his master, Jesus Christ. I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. But none of those things moved Jesus, and none of those things moved Paul. Now, here's a question I want to ask just before I move on to my next point. But listen, Paul said, none of these things move me. Let me ask you just a very pointed question. What would it take to move you in the same sense that Paul meant it? What would it take to shake you from your faith in Jesus Christ? I think about it. I think about it in regards to the story of Job, don't you sometimes? There's Job uh, doing his thing, just following God, be being a faithful follower of the Lord on earth. A and the Lord brags about Job to Satan himself. And Satan says, well, Job's nothing. He, he only serves you because you bless him in certain ways. A and if you allow me, God, to take away some of those blessings, Job will curse you to, you to your face. You see, Satan thought he knew what would make Job be moved from following the Lord. Satan was wrong. But I wonder if, if uh, the devil doesn't have your number knowing what might move you. What, what, what would be lost? Really, do, do you have a relationship with God that basically says, okay, Lord, as long as this goes right in my life, I'll serve you. But if this goes wrong, well, forget it. Can I just say, I pray God would lift you up to a higher ground so that you would have, and I'm going to use a very strong word here, but I'll use it nevertheless, that you would not have such a mercenary relationship with God. That basically, you'll serve him as long as he gives you the goodies you expect. Let me tell you what you can absolutely expect from God. You can absolutely expect from him eternal life and love in Jesus Christ. You can expect that from him. But along the way, there's going to be trials. You know this. Some of you in this very room, you've experienced it through this past year. It's been a year of some blessing, but it's been a year of some significant trials. But you can say God has been faithful even in the midst of them. Listen, isn't that true that each one of us should be able to say, none of these things move me? Jesus Christ, you helping me, I will not turn back. I'll run my race and I'll run it with joy. I don't count my life dear to myself. The same attitude that God worked in his servant, the Apostle Paul, he can work it in us as well. But I want you to consider something else from verse 24. When Paul talks about, nor do I count my life dear to myself, or that I may finish my race with joy, it shows that even at that point, Paul had his death in mind. Do you see that? He's thinking, I could die. God's been warning me all along the way in this trip to Jerusalem that this could be my last, that I'll never see the Ephesian leaders or church anymore, that this could be the end of it. I could die doing this. And as Paul now considered all that he was going forth with, everything that he was doing, his whole life, his whole ministry, he figured, I want to do something worth dying for. I love this. I, uh, I read a beautiful sermon by Charles Spurgeon on this. And I forget what he titled the, the, the sermon, but it was something like this. It was a gospel worth dying for. And he challenged every preacher. He challenged every preacher, preacher, are you preaching a gospel that's worth dying for? That's a big challenge, isn't it? Because, you know, there's some preachers, they're not just preaching gospel of moral reform. Hey, everybody, let's lift ourselves up morally. You know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and let's live a more moral life. Now, that's a fine gospel. I wish people would live more moral lives. I do. But is that worth dying for? I don't think so. Some people preach a gospel of saving yourself through good works. Come on now, get serious. You can save yourself. You can be good enough. You can earn your way to God. And there are people preaching, I'll tell you, that's definitely not worth dying for. Some people preach a gospel merely of social action and improvement. And is social action and social improvement good? Yes. We want to see society bettered. We want to see society lifted up. It's good for you and I to be doing good works in our community. But that gospel, the gospel of mere social activity and improvement, is that worth dying for? 
No way. The, the gospel of, of merely uh, religious traditions or just trying to have spiritual conversations about, or the gospel of mystical mumbo jumbo. Is any of that worth dying for? No way. How about the, the gospel of, of trying to seek the church that's really cool and truly hip? Man, that's not worth dying for. The gospel of self-esteem, the gospel of ecological salvation, the gospel of political correctness, the gospel of uh, emergent church feel-good-ism. Listen, whatever you want to say about those things, I'll tell you this, none of that's worth dying for. Pastor, are you going to put your head on the chopping block for any one of those things? But no, there is a gospel worth dying for. There is a gospel, there's a message from God that's so precious that it's worth the life. And many people have paid that ultimate price to say that on a cross outside of the walls of Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago, that the perfect man, fully God and fully man, he poured out his blood in the ultimate sacrifice so that what he did in his death would be a full payment for all the guilt, all the shame, all the penalty, all the judgment that my sin and your sin deserved and that we can be saved by looking to him and trusting in who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross and realizing that his resurrection proves it all it was true now that's a gospel we're dying for I love how Spurgeon put it let me read you a little quote he says this he says yet there used to be a gospel in the world which consisted of facts which Christians never questioned there was once in the church a gospel in which believers hugged in their hearts as if it were their soul's life. There used to be a gospel in the world which provoked enthusiasm and commanded sacrifice. Tens of thousands have met together to hear this gospel at the peril of their lives. Men to the teeth of tyrants have proclaimed it and have suffered the loss of all things and have gone to prison and to death for it singing psalms all the while. Is there not such a gospel remaining? And I believe there is. And it's a challenge to each and every one of us. Listen, we, we just got to make sure that the message we're focused on, the message we advance both as individuals and from this pulpit and as a congregation as a whole, it's of ultimate importance that it is a gospel worth dying for. And Paul builds on it and touches on it in verse 25 where he says this. And indeed, now, I know that you all, among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God, you'll see my face no more. I'm really struck by what Paul says there in verse 25. I'm struck by that when I consider the breadth of his ministry there in Ephesus. You know, in Acts chapter 19, verse 11, it says that Paul did unusual miracles that God through the hands of Paul remember that the handkerchiefs and aprons thing man that's just weird that's amazing mind-bending miracles that God did through the hands of Paul in Ephesus uh, Acts chapter 19 says that uh, demonic spirits said that they knew Paul they knew his ministry it was a time of the miraculous it was a time uh, of victory over demonic spirits It was a time of amazing healings it was an amazing time there in Ephesus but despite all that, Paul does not say to the Ephesian elders, you all among whom I did some awesome miracles. He didn't say that, did he? Or how about this? Uh, you all among whom even the demons said that they knew me. Instead, Paul always focused on the life transforming power of the word of God. And he said this, you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. It's almost as if Paul said this, yeah, sure, I do a lot of other things, but at my core, I'm a preacher. And I preach the kingdom of God, and you, did you see that there in verse 25? You all will see my face no more. I just think of Paul as he said this to the Ephesian elders, great sadness, great compassion, but great courage. He told them there's something that he had alluded to but hadn't exactly said before. That, hey, you Ephesian elders, you guys who just walked 30 miles to hear me speak to you, this will be the last time that I ever see you. And I can imagine that this exploded like a bombshell on a playground to these church leaders. Don't forget the great bond that Paul had with these leaders. And he said, listen, these great bonds that we have, this would be the last time that we see it. Basically, so I wonder if they thought that maybe he was joking. Oh, Paul, 
You're such a kidder. Never see us again? Come on, Paul. I know it might be a couple years, but we'll run into each other again. But he says, no. In all likelihood, you will see my face no more. What love, what compassion Paul had for the people of that congregation. But you know what? That was just simply a reflection of Jesus' great love and concern for them. Paul followed Jesus in every way that he could. And since Jesus loved these believers so much, so did Paul. I want you to think about that, church. I want you to think about how that applies to you. Do you know why you should love the body of Christ? Do you know why you should love this congregation and the people all around you? It's not necessarily because they're so lovable. Because some of you aren't, some of you aren't. No, you know why? Very simply put, because Jesus loves these people around you. He does. He loves them all. He loves them deeply. Jesus loves his people both individually and collectively. And if you have the heart of Jesus, you will love them too with some of the same passion that the Apostle Paul had. You know what? It's a bad sign when we get this attitude sometimes in the church where you go, oh, I love Jesus. It's just his people I can't stand. <laughs> okay, so here's the problem. Here's the incongruity. Those people that sometimes you can't stand, Jesus really loves them. And if you have a hard time doing it, can you just ask Jesus for his heart? Because a lot of what God is doing is he just simply wants us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That's exactly what Paul was doing. You know, it kind of blows my mind to think of how similar Paul's ministry was to Jesus's here. I mean, think about it. Like Jesus, Paul was traveling to Jerusalem with a group of his disciples. Like Jesus, Paul was opposed by hostile Jews who plotted against his life. Like Jesus, Paul made or received three successive predictions of his coming sufferings in Jerusalem, including that he would be handed over to the Gentiles. Like Jesus, Paul declared his readiness to lay down his life. Like Jesus, Paul was determined to complete his ministry and not be deflected from it. And like Jesus, he expressed his complete abandonment to the will of God. Paul was just following Jesus. And this is what God has you to do, to follow him wherever he advances you, wherever he takes you. Would we expect any different? Is the servant greater than the master? So if Jesus was willing to go through to the end, so him working in our life, we will be also. So friends, can I just say that if your heart doesn't already come to that place where you say, not trusting in yourself, but trusting in the Lord himself, none of these things move me. Then I just want to pray for you right now that God would give you that kind of heart, that he would build it in you, that he would do it both just as a gift from heaven and as a process of spiritual growth, that you would not be moved by uncertainty, by threats, by dangers, whatever it is that faces you. You'd never be moved by that.